Okay, let's watch ABC News start off the night relatively enthusiastic and then watch their change in tone as it becomes clear Donald Trump is going to win. Let's see what's happening in Pennsylvania with the female voters. 53% of those, again, this is preliminary, 53% of those voters say that they are women and they are breaking in favor of Kamala Harris by 55% compared to Donald Trump. This is roughly about the same with where women were for Joe Biden in 2020. White women in particular, white women make up 42%, again, again uh, based on these preliminary polls, and 48% of the white women voting for Kamala Harris, Donald Trump is beating her out when it comes to white women. Now, what makes this election potentially different from the past is that this is the first presidential election since Roe v. Wade was overturned. You have abortion on 10 states, uh, abortion on the ballot, on the yeah. ballot yeah. in 10 states. Two of them uh, with Nevada and uh, Arizona are battleground states. So will abortion make a difference in this election? Do you have a metric there that compares? Not really white women from Biden. Not like it did in 2022, at least. Biden four years ago and how she's... It's roughly the same. We don't actually have it in a graph yeah, form, yeah. but she's running about the same as Biden so far. 2% better than where Biden was in 2020. 2%. And in a very tight race, though, that could make all the difference. And Martha, there has been significant outreach, uh, in particular, to suburban white women in Pennsylvania. A absolutely. She absolutely needs those suburban white women in Pennsylvania, across all of the battleground states, of course, but particularly there. And those women, the women I've talked to in Pennsylvania, in those battleground states, all over the place. It is Donald Trump's language that is turning them off. And Kamala Harris is taking full advantage of that. She's reminding voters the kinds of things Donald Trump has said, like, I want to protect women whether they like it or not. He talks, he calls her names. He calls her hearted. He calls her names that are very offensive. She actually said that, by the way, I blurred it a little bit for YouTube, but she said that on our bomb on ABC, maybe not the best word to be saying on a national broadcast like ABC News. I don't understand that, but maybe Martha Raddatz is totally over woke more than even the rest of us. To female voters, but they are also a voting block that gets out there. And when you look at those long lines that we've been talking about tonight, women are very, very motivated and very angry. Uh, women I've talked to in these states about what Donald Trump has said, they may- The media has been trying to convince us of that for 10 years now. Oh, women are so angry at Donald Trump. There hasn't been that much resistance this time to him winning, if you've noticed. Like in 2016, there was those hats, massive rallies, the women's march. I don't see much of that this time. Surely there's still some, but it seems like the quote unquote Trump resistance is a little tired. Stay in those lines, those low propensity male voters that Donald Trump has gone after, those those younger voters who don't usually vote, will they stay in those in those lines? But we have just seen that massive gender gap. Yeah, really interesting. And you heard the warning, uh, Mary Bruce, from Nikki Haley in, in recent days, particularly after uh, Madison Square Garden, that the sort of uh, the, the sort of bromance or the bro presentation is something. See, this definitely doesn't sound fair and balanced yet. If you remember the person talking, David Muir, that's Mr. One Side Fact Checker from the presidential debate, if you remember that, with Kamala and Trump. These rallies, she reminded, uh, she was sending out a message to the Trump campaign that, remember, women vote. Absolutely, and that is what the Kamala Harris campaign is banking on, that women will come out and vote, especially Republican women, especially in Pennsylvania. They have made a huge push for those hidden Harris voters that we had been talking about, for those dissatisfied Republican voters. I think back to an event uh, in Bucks County just a couple weeks ago where Harris was standing there on stage with over 100 uh, Republican officials and aides to former Republican presidents, making the argument, uh, echoing the argument that Liz Cheney has made to Republican women, that you can come out, put country above party and you don't have to tell anyone and you don't have to tell first of all this did not work at all trump won around 94 percent of republicans a bunch of unpopular kind of rhino style republicans telling people to vote for kamala did not work and i think that was so obvious liz cheney is, does anyone really like is anyone a serious fan of liz cheney anymore i don't think so and this other part it's very creepy the kamala ads just vote for kamala but don't tell your husband very weird tell anyone about your vote and also one other thing that terry was pointing on you know the ground operation in pennsylvania is just massive and it is something that the harris campaign is eager to tout tonight now 11 p.m in the east 8 p.m in the west yeah knocking on people's doors i don't think knocking on people's doors 
really works anymore. The ground game. John Stewart, I think, rightly was making fun of the Democrats for being so proud of their ground game. I'm not sure. I was just making sure you're all still here with me. It continues right now. The Harris campaign, uh, and basically you got your hands on a memo that went out to internal staff saying this is going to buckle up. This is going to be a long election. Th this email reads like a reality check from the Harris campaign manager to this to her staff. We have obtained this by ABC News. And so this is a little bit further in the night. The tone has changed a bit, but the ABC News at least still holding on hope. She says what we have all been talking about, that they knew this race was going to be razor thin. She says this is exactly what they prepared for and that their clearest path to 270 remains to be through the blue wall that we've been talking about all night. She says we feel good about what we are seeing. That said, she is cautioning that this is going to take some time. She runs through those blue wall states, saying in Pennsylvania they overperformed, saying in Pennsylvania they overperformed turnout expectations in Philadelphia. She says they're seeing especially high turnout with large non-white and student populations. And then in Michigan and Wisconsin, she notes, you know, they are still awaiting a significant amount of the vote to come in. In Michigan, pointing to Detroit, also saying other results in Michigan are harder to parse. In Wisconsin, she points to remaining vote in Dane and Milwaukee counties. And then what she says, David, is what we do know is this race is not going to come into focus until the early morning. This is a massive cope session, though, because at this point in the night, it's hard to say exactly what the time is. But look, it's already, according to their count, it was on there 214 roughly to 145. The odds were already so much in Trump's favor at this point in the night. Hours, David, she urges their team to, quote, get some sleep and get ready to close out strong tomorrow. John. But, but can I, I say that, that is absolutely the message that we're hearing. That didn't happen. The race got called very shortly after that statement happened tonight from the Kamala Harris campaign. Uh, but I am also talking to Democrats, not precisely on the Kamala Harris campaign, but with very much a vested interest in what's happening here, who are feeling that this is looking very bad for her. Exactly. At least this guy's being way more honest than whatever that woman just said. Feeling that this is looking very bad for her, uh, who are uh, very concerned about the trends they're seeing both in those Sun Belt states, concerns about what they're seeing in Wisconsin and seeing a, a path, sure, this is not over, it's certainly not over, but seeing it as a very steep and narrow path for Kamala Harris. And do they recognize in a lot of these Republican counties, it's, it's sort of like a... Very vested in this campaign, although to be sure, as you've heard from Mary, uh, the campaign, the, the Harris campaign, still very much sees a path and says this is going to be long and we need to be patient. And I think when they say long, they don't mean a long night, they mean yeah. a long week. Yeah. yeah. That didn't happen. It was probably maybe two hours from this moment. It's hard to say. I don't know the exact time, but that didn't happen. The race was called that night, very decisively, by the way, for Trump. All right. Well, that's sobering, John Carl. <laughs> appreciate it. Take no offense. We appreciate the reporting and the analysis. And, you, and, and you're right, because you point to Madison, you point to Charlotte and some of these other uh, cities where she has performed. But And as we're told, the former president. So now we'll go ahead a little bit. We'll look at the difference between the Kamala HQ and the Trump HQ on election night. Is on his way here to West Palm Beach. David. All right, Whit Johnson in West Palm Beach tonight. Whit, as soon as he gets there, you'll let us know. Let's go over to Eva Pilgrim. Uh, she's in Washington, D.C., Howard University. Eva, uh, I, I gather the temperature uh, uh, of the evening has shifted there. Quite remarkably, very different than what Witt is seeing there at the Trump campaign. You can see this was a very crowded area just a short time ago, the one we last came to you. The crowd is leaving. They have been leaving for some time now. Um, and, you know, the campaign is telling us that they still think that there is a chance that they can hold that blue wall. But there are a lot of nerves and a lot of reservations that people are having. We heard Witt talking about the fact that the former president is on his way to his campaign event. At last check just a moment ago, the vice president is still at the Naval Conservatory, which is the vice president's residence here in D.C., is not on her way here. Um, and as you watch that crowd there uh, shifting away. From uh, Mark Cuban, who, of course... Kamala should have been the person, though, to give a, that speech that that guy came out at Howard University. It's weird that Kamala just waited till the next day to talk, but whatever. Was a very prominent surrogate and supporter of Kamala Harris. I interviewed him uh, just over a week ago. Uh, he's saying, congrats, Donald Trump, you won fair and square. Again, we haven't called it yet, but that's a very prominent 
uh, supporter who was out there campaigning for Kamala Harris going out and saying, congratulating Donald Trump, and by the way, also congratulating. Did you see, did you see the look on the other panel members' faces there? Oh, my goodness, especially this woman here. Not thrilled at all. Same with that. That's Lindsay Davis. She was the other moderator of the of the debate. <laughs> that's so funny. Congratulating Donald Trump, and by the way, also congratulating Elon Musk as well. But that's certainly not the message coming from the Kamala Harris campaign. Yeah. Just to be clear, Mark Cuban may be a very you know a top supporter of Kamala Harris, but their campaign is still insisting they have a slim path. They have a slim path here. Here. But even they recognize that in kind yes. of going dark tonight or going quiet. Yeah that they're opening up all of this yeah. sort of airtime and conversation to the real possibility that Donald Trump is going to return as president, particularly given the mathematical path here that we yeah. see ahead of us with the blue wall. I mean, he, he, there's no way around it. He's had a very impressive yeah. night, uh, not only in the Sun Belt, but right through uh, the blue wall states. And so in not giving sort of any sort of ex more explanation from the Harris campaign, this is where the conversation is going to go. And they know that. Look, I they made a choice. Kamala Harris not coming out tonight to speak, likely because she didn't really know what to say. I mean, you know, they, they still want to see the rest of these numbers. But so what? That could be like the slogan for Kamala's campaign, not to be too harsh, but she did not know what to say. Could be like a tagline for a lot of these interviews. It's just didn't go that well. And again, I'm, I don't really want to dunk on Kamala specifically um, anymore, like she lost, but she did not know what to say far too often throughout the campaign. That's my opinion anyway come in. The last sort of official word from the Kamala Harris campaign is that they are waiting this out. They want to see, you know, every last vote counted in these key states, but they are seeing exactly what we are seeing. This is certainly not the night they wanted and had hoped to have. Are they The total, the run up the score in these urban areas. Uh, have the Democrats, one of the things in the postmortem, I think, for both of these campaigns, but for certainly for the Democrats, will be you can't just count on the urban areas. You've got it. You've got to connect with rural America, with you know working class America. You can't you can't win these races. You you show the evolution of the electoral map over the last several presidential cycles. Uh, moving forward, the Democratic Party is going to have to figure that out somehow. Are they not? It's actually a good point. First good point we've heard so far on this ABC broadcast. This is a moment of truth for, for Democrats. They, 10 years ago, what was it, uh, a little bit longer, that uh, Democrats thought demography is destiny and they are the natural party of government because America is becoming more diverse. There'll be a, 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 a lower share of, of white uh, voters. And it turns out that's completely wrong. You have to talk to people, meet their needs, and answer uh, their questions. And that includes rural voters as well. And it includes, you know, voters that... that for whatever reason, have bought into uh, what Donald Trump stands for, which is the end of the ruling establishment, not just in government, but in all kinds of institutions, including the media. People like that. Yeah, and, and some of it might be... That whole, like, dem demographics as destiny thing with regard to voting, it's a little bit suspect. I mean, you can argue that that's a little bit racist, and Trump this election did great relative to Republicans in the past, with the Hispanic vote, for example. It is just such a daunting math. And I, I've just, I've been clicking around on this board to try to find any way to piece together the votes. And look, there's always a hypothetical. And you could say, well, if all of these votes that we think are out break in one direction, then maybe, maybe, maybe. But it is just really hard to strain to see the numbers in this one state to say nothing of the three states that we're talking about. What, what we saw across the night will go to former president. Trying to find the vote, that's funny. Donald Trump, ABC News can now project that Donald Trump has won the 19 electoral votes in the state of Pennsylvania. We had said for many weeks leading up to this election that this was a must-win state for both Kamala Harris and for Donald Trump. ABC News now projecting Donald Trump wins the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, Rick Klein, take us to the board. That essentially gets him the presidency, although we have not called what he absolutely needs to get to get there, right? But you yeah. see the and path I, on the board. Ta talk us be, through it. I want to be careful with the math here. That that gives us, according to ABC News projections, 265 electoral votes uh, for... ...clear to cross this country, and in particular among those key battleground states. 
It does very much look like Donald Trump will be returning to the White House. We are being very careful, uh, waiting for the final results to come in in Wisconsin. As to the network, uh, and thank you for being here. This is ABC News Live coverage of Election Night 2024. It's now uh, just before 3 a.m. Eastern Time. John Carl, uh, former President Donald Trump up there, he was uh, talking about being the 45th president, the 47th president, um, and uh, he thanked his family, his supporters, and, and talked about uh, the extraordinary night. So David Muir, the person talking, compared to CBS and MSNBC, he still sounds pretty professional, to give him credit. Like, he's not moping. He doesn't sound too depressed. But the other panel members, as you'll see in a second here, they sound, they're wearing their emotions more on their sleeve. I don't think anybody in the Republican Party, any, any of the, the, the leaders in the Republican Party, I don't even think our, our friend Reince over here, uh, would have imagined Donald Trump coming back after he left the White House the way uh, he left uh, in, in, in January of 2021. Uh, and then to win the way he won, uh, to win the popular vote, to win decisively uh, in the Electoral College, to have what appears to be, at least potentially, lining up to be a clean sweep of, of the battleground states. Um, look, uh, Democrats spent more money than Donald Trump on this race. Uh, Democrats uh, thought they had more enthusiasm than Donald Trump. They were uh, proven to be wrong on, on, on that score. Uh, this this uh, was something I, I was talking to Democrats in the final days of this campaign uh, who believed that they had a chance, that Kamala Harris had a chance to, to basically run the table on the battleground states. They thought that something had fundamentally changed in the race. This is what we were told. I know Mary heard uh, the same thing, um, and it just wasn't there. Donald Trump won and won decisively, we're waiting for our final call. Our but what we, what Democrats thought they were going to run the table. That's so funny. What yeah. we've called so far. I wonder if they actually thought that, though, or they were just saying that. It's, uh, it's, it's astounding. Mary Bruce, anything more from the Harris campaign tonight? They are notably dark. They are notably dark, and, and silence uh, speaks volumes, I think, at this hour. Uh, we do know that she is going to come out and speak tomorrow. The remarks that she had planned to give tonight were postponed. She'll be there speaking, we believe, at Howard University tomorrow. Um, I just keep thinking about the picture that they had been painting of Donald Trump in the last days and weeks, this really dire picture, you know, calling him unfit, saying that he simply doesn't represent and stand for the ideals of this country. Kamala Harris called Donald Trump a fascist. And she continued to argue over and over again that she could bring the country forward, that she could turn the page. And it turns out that the country did want to turn the page. They just wanted to turn the page on Kamala Harris and Joe Biden's administration. And what a remarkable, different vision uh, we are now getting for, from this uh, from this election. You know, elections tell you a lot about what the country stands for and what the country wants. And, and it is just such a drastically different vision from the one that Kamala Harris was outlining. And wonder what Nobody can really tell, though, what Kamala was outlining. What was she outlining? Her, the things she would talk about were pretty narrow policy prescriptions, like, like a first-time homeowner tax credit, things like that. Kamala never really had a big vision other than just no one touch anything. Don't change anything. I'm not different from Biden. I mean, like, can anyone really articulate as a major person on television what Kamala's vision was? Not really. What, if any, role race and gender played? I mean, we're talking about, uh, we have one of... It wouldn't be a mainstream media panel without going to this, going to the well of identity politics. My goodness. Uh, one thing that stands out, a less diverse electorate. Uh, when you think about even just at large with the world of the 193 UN uh, member nations, only 13 have a woman uh, who leads them. Black women are often the last to the table when it comes to even uh, pay disparity in this country, getting 67 cents on the dollar when it comes to, to white men. Uh, you know, Barbara Jordan, when she was asked in 1976, do you think that this country is ready to have a black woman on the national ticket? She said no. And, and so I just, I don't know that we have the answers tonight. I'm honestly convinced a lot of these political pundits, this is all they know. This is all they've been studying for the last decade. They can't do analysis without bringing it back to identity politics. That's what I think is just happening. They just, they're, they don't have any other ideas. They're like, uh, she's a black woman, uh. But I think that that is kind of the elephant in the room that, that we're not talking about because we're not just talking about having a woman. Okay. We're talking about having a woman of color. And, and I think that that's something that we cannot underestimate uh, when we see 
uh, this increasing uh, red spread uh, throughout the country. And this is now the second time that Donald Trump has blocked Democrats' hopes of electing the first woman president. And think about how differently she ran compared to Hillary Clinton, who was always talking about this is the yep. highest, hardest ceiling, the, the glass cracks in the ceiling. She was planning her whole uh, victory speech at the Javits Center mm -hmm. to have that big glass ceiling. And it, with Kamala Harris, and I noticed it in her interview with, yeah. with you, when, when you asked her about kind of like the historic nature of this, and she made a joke about it and said, I'm well aware of my race and gender and again made it about a substance maybe thinking but perhaps it didn't work so well for hillary clinton i'm going to kind of shy away from that as to tr potentially not alienate voters. and I, I could never tell if to kamala's credit she actually did not lean into that that much if you're going to say she made it about substance i don't know again all of her thing all of like the policy things she talked about were way too narrow i think but she didn't really make it all about look at me i'm a woman of color so Credit there, I guess, just because I don't think that's helpful right now in the country of America. It's so divisive, unfortunately, but yeah, maybe not unfortunately, just it's so divisive. We got to get back to coming together in some way as a world. If it was lessons learned from Hillary Clinton's campaign or, or a sign of progress in this country that a woman could run for president sure. and not have it be about being a woman, to just lean into substance. But the fact that she never talked about it, she went out of her way, but that doesn't mean that it wasn't at the top of the mind and, for and so many. I can only imagine what is going through her head as she has to switch gears and go from writing what I imagine she had hoped was a victory speech to now coming out and somehow, you know, thanking her supporters trying to offer perhaps some kind of explanation as to how we got here. And given the optimistic, positive tone that she tried to finish her campaign on, you know, give her vote, give supporters and her voters some hope because she did outline a very stark contrast in this race and made very clear that she thought Donald Trump was a danger to America. A th That's her, that was her entire message though. There's no stark contrast. It was just vote for me again because I'm not Trump. Democrats have been doing this for 10 years. Threat to democracy. And yet she also wanted to end on, on a note of unity. How does she merge those two messages now and, and transfer some of that optimism to, to, to the you know, large portion of the population that is outraged and upset by, by what appears to be very much the, the results in another Donald Trump presidency? More people are happy, though. Trump won essentially everything. So I don't know about that comment. He won. Well, I mean, some people are obviously upset, but more people are happy. Trump won popular vote. Republicans won Senate. Republicans won House. Republicans won and Trump popular vote. Another thing that they won, which I think is incredible. I don't know if you call it win, but for the first time in a long time, Republicans are winning in culture. I think that is very important as well. Donald Trump, ABC News now projecting, will be the next president of the United States and part of the path uh, that he built uh, along the electoral map is this blue wall that the Democrats were convinced would be Kamala Harris's best route to the presidency. Uh, Donald Trump winning Pennsylvania and now he has won Wisconsin, he won North Carolina and Georgia and a number of other battlegrounds are still being counted where he holds uh, leads. Uh, significant so Mr. One Side Fact Check David Muir does not sound that thrilled to be reading that off. Well, let me know what you think. That's pretty monotone and a little bit of a, a hint of sadness. Uh, even though we've been reporting on this and the analysis has been excellent and careful from the whole team here all night long, uh, but we are here and Mary Bruce, John Carl, your first reaction here to the official news, Donald Trump is headed back to the White House. Uh, look, uh, we, we, we said it as we approach this this point. This is just an unbelievable comeback, the greatest political. Uh, so I'll end the video here, but that was a very, very entertaining watch. I hope you enjoyed that. Watching their somewhat optimistic mood at the beginning, and it starts to trail off as they realize some of the middle part where some of those uh, people on the ABC panel were trying to say, she still has a chance, she still has a chance. That was pretty funny as well, but... Anyway, with that said, thank you for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Have a great day.